Hallelujah. We bless you, Father. Oh, we lift you up, Jesus. All the glory to our Father, all the glory to our King. Oh, Jesus, we bless you, Lord.
your spirit this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your presence among us this morning. Lord, we thank you for your touch this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Let me hear you give God the highest praise this morning. Let me hear you give God the highest praise this morning. The highest praise this morning belongs to our God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Before you sit, turn around and greet your neighbor next to you. Welcome to CA Tampa. Welcome to CA Tampa. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give those that are online a hand this morning. Welcome to CA Tampa. We thank you for taking the time and precious schedule to join us this morning. We thank you this morning for those of you who are here this morning to worship with us. If it is your very first time here in the house, we'd like for you to just wave at us and our ushers will come forward to bring you our connection card. There you can fill it out for us and then we can follow up with you. If you are joining us through our social media, we can click on link number one and fill out our connection card for us and we will also follow up with you. Amen. 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 Si etin. Si etin. Tempa. We exist to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And I hope it's to lead is to help you uh, lead you to experience uh, the God that delivers, the God that heals, the God that elevates, and the God that satisfies. Amen. 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 Give a hand for that God this morning that we serve. Amen. And our mission is on four. Love God, love people, and make a difference. Tell your neighbor, I love you this morning. Hey, 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 hey. Amen. Amen. And we are making differences in the community and our church every day. Amen. Amen. Our announcement, uh, as you know, previously, every second and fourth, we do our fundraising. But moving forward, our fundraising is every fourth Sunday. Amen. Amen. So this month, fourth Sunday, uh, this is where we uh, kitchen ministry uh, prepare a dinner for you guys and after service you have opportunity to purchase a dinner go home and and enjoy amen amen and if you um if you already have a plan maybe to invite some friends remember this is a, for us to support for us to leave this building financially for us to find a place to be and for us to have more space to grow amen amen, amen. so you can always donate you can always support to that process amen Amen. Also, today is second Sunday. This is growth track two. This is the most interesting growth track. This is where you find out what is it that God put inside of me to do? What is my gift? What is my talent that God put on inside of me to serve the church? Amen? To serve my community. Because making the difference uh, uh, in our community is us. And it's what God put into us that we will pull out and uh, out in the community, amen, by loving people, by loving them first, loving people, and making a difference in our community, amen, amen, uh, so we invite you to do that, and remember, also, our fourth Sunday is Baptism Sunday, hey, it's Baptism Sunday, uh, this month, so if you are here, if you know your friends that haven't been baptized, please, you could see me, you could see Pastor, uh, talk to us, and then we will uh, give you the channel and reach that you have to make the process out. Amen? Amen. So don't don't hide out. Don't say, hey, should I, you know, what is it that, do, am, I, am I ready to be baptized? What is it that, I, see us and we will guide you through the process. Amen? Amen? Amen. So it's happening this month, last Sunday of this month. Also at this time is the time that, you know, for the past uh, couple of months, Pastor had lost a vision regarding uh, the different uh, um, uh, pledges that you could make. We thank you this morning for many of you who already been pledging to that process. We help, we ask you to continue. And if you haven't pledged yet, we ask you to see us, uh, see the finest team, see 
the ushers are, are there, they can give you the card, the information that you need so that you can sign up and pledge for that. You would please stand on your feet. This is the time for the, uh, for the offering. This is the time of giving. This is a time where we also uh, demonstrate our love. Just like God demonstrated his love for us when he gave his only begotten son so that also we can demonstrate the love for him and also invest in his kingdom. Amen? Amen. So at this time, this is the time for giving. We have so many opportunities to give to the app, to the, our website. And it's, it's presented here on the TV screens. And also, if you have cash or check during the worship, you're welcome to come forward and present your offering and to, the, to God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We give you honor. We give you glory what you're doing here at CA Tampa, Lord. We thank you for every soul that is here, every soul that is watching us through our social media, Father. We pray that you will touch them this morning. Father, as we present our offering through the main, different means that you're giving us opportunity to do so, Father, we pray for those who are doing so this morning. Those who want to but unable to, Father, you are the God that opens door. You are the God that makes a way where there's no way, Father. We pray that, that you will do so for them, Father. Open the door so they may invest, Father. Your word declared is more blessed to give than to receive, Father. This morning, Father, as they present their gift, Father. Oh, bless them, Father, we pray. This morning, Father, as your word come forth to bless us, to transform us, to change our mind, Father, to change our soul, to put us on the right path, Father. We pray that our soul is ready to receive, our heart is ready to receive, and our mind is ready to be transformed. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Clap your hand for Jesus.
It begins with openness. The willingness to come alongside someone else. To pour out. Care. Invest. It's about sharing the journey. Doing life. Together. Growing. Forging. Becoming. It's about selflessness. Caring enough to walk through the valley. Even when it's painful. To love people as Christ has loved us. It's rejoicing when they rejoice. Hurting when they hurt. Being a hand. An encourager. A friend. We were not created to wander alone. For as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Amen. Today is, uh, you know, second Sunday of the month is always our uh, family, relationship, and anything that has to do with that. So, and I hope you understand that as iron shopping, iron, that's uh, the purpose of this, so we can do life well. We don't want to just go to heaven. We didn't just get saved so, uh, to escape the world, because God wants us in the world. He, he, Jesus left us in the world to be the light of the world. And, and as your leader, my purpose is to make sure we don't dread being here on earth. So we're looking for death as an escape. Because we don't know how to do relationship. We don't know how to live together. We don't know how to make things work with our spouses, with boyfriends, girlfriends, significant others, and family. And then uh, we want to die because we, don't, we are not living a fulfilling life. Uh, there is nothing more fulfilling when you have a few people that you do life with that you know they love you, you love them, and will do anything for you, you'll do anything for them. And this is the reason why we exist, and God knows. That's why when he created Adam, Adam was self-sufficient. He, he was created in God's image. But God said it's not good that he does life alone. I will give him a helpmeet. And this is the purpose of us setting aside a Sunday, a month, just to wrestle and, uh, with some of those things that we can get better at in order to live life, uh, a purposeful life, and to its fullest. Uh, before we get in uh, the teaching today, just want to make sure we remind you we're still in the building project uh, to raise uh, over a million dollars for uh, to help us uh, acquire the land and move on to the next sec I mean the second phase after that uh, to uh, move out of this place uh, and build that uh, uh, church that we know God wants us to do. Uh, so make sure uh, the months are coming. You know, uh, if you need to have a conversation. With uh, in terms of how to do this installments and all that, you can see uh, Edder, Maclean, and uh, several other people that are part of that commission, and uh, to begin to do so, please. And um, on fourth Sunday, make sure you come ready also. Uh, part also of the fundraising, where uh, the kitchen ministry provides a wonderful meal. Uh, you know, that you don't have to worry about cooking at your house, but you can use that that day. And for those of you who have a specific, uh, powerful, uh, proven, uh, you know, testimony that you would love to share with this assembly, make sure you see Brother McLean also so he can capture that on tape and then do the proper editing, put nice music, make you a superstar, you know, uh, so we can let our church share you know, what God is doing or has done in your life. Uh, and uh, we can also put it on our YouTube page. Uh, so 
people can see, you know, that prayer works. And here are some testimony to testify that. All right, let's get into the word. We want to address today the subject, building a strong foundation, the role of love and commitment and commitment in family. Uh, because we live in a world where the world is getting full with a bunch of cowards. People want to get married. People want to uh, be in relationship, but they are so cowards. And they can't even do it. They, they can engage. They can really make commitment to anything. It's like we say we love people, but we cannot make any commitment. Um, and we've said that for, uh, for, for some of us. We said, when somebody's dating, what we call dating, and the Christian sphere, you know, what you're saying is somebody who also was basically interviewing for a position in your family. And if we begin to see it that way, that's the one time you get to choose your family. So you want to look at this person and say, do I want this person to be the father or mother of my kids? Am I going to do my life with this person forever? So remember, you don't go crazy. You don't think about what trending on X or whatever, IG, uh, you know, uh, swap shop, whatever you guys have your stuff, okay? You want to make sure you do it the Bible way so you don't come and cry. Because if you have to come to my office, I'm going to charge you for that. There's a difference. And, and I'm just telling you, the, the, the preaching the gospel is free. But therapy, you get charged. In fact, you won't even see me. It's all going to be online. You make your deposit, so don't come and cry. I can't pay pass. Okay, get out. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this is not 1950s anymore. Okay, we get certification. We study. We pay money. You know, I have mouths to feed and a little puppy called also to feed. So I have to buy dog food. All right, it's all good. Uh, so... Make sure before you jump into a relationship, you know, you don't just remember, you are actually have the chance to build a family. So can this person really be a member of your family? If you don't even trust them, why you want to press a relationship with somebody you don't even trust? And then you want them in your family? They're going to raise your kid. You, you, you're going to become smarter than that. So let's look at what God's word is telling us here. Matthew 7, verse 24 and verse 25. And when you begin to imagine relationship, family, your dating experience, you know, whatever you do, where, whatever stage you're in, when you begin to see those things as an investment, then you're going to think twice before you just give yourself away. So then anyone who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. Verse 25, the rain poured down, the rivers flooded over, and the wind blew hard against that house, but it did not fall because it was built on the rock. And in a different gospel, we have the tales of the two houses, one built on the sand and one built on the rock. And the rain came and the wind came. In the first place, this is an, a very interesting analogy. You have two houses built with the same material, but standing on different ground. On the surface, they both look super great house in river views. But guess what? We're going to see which one's going to stand the test of time. It's not even based upon the material they were built with, but on their foundation. On the surface, your marriage, your family can look like the next person. But we will know what your marriage, what your family is built on when the storm, the rain, and the wind comes. And guess what, folks? They will come. There's no such thing as having as escaping tragedy, heartaches, disappointments in this life. In this life, you will have to deal with issues. 
They will come. Will your family, will your relationship, you know, stand the test of time? This metaphor we just read here in Matthew 7, uh, verse 24, 25, we see the house represents a person, life, or soul. I want you to, to hear me well. This house represents a person, life, or your soul. That represents you. And the rock symbolizes the teachings and the words of Jesus. That is why, you know, we, sometimes we are torn between, uh, you know, giving the words, teaching the word, because we live in a culture where people want to be entertained. And because they want to entertain, they tend to influence how people do church. Because people want to come and get sweaty, and then they go in the parking lot, they are as dumb as a rock. Sorry, I didn't mean to insult anyone. But, and then they feel, man, the service was great. It was good. What did you learn? I don't know, but it was good. And, and uh, we have this mindset because we all subscribe to tons of things we don't even have time to watch. And we don't have time to learn. We just want to be entertained. Yet, we lack the skills to do life because we refuse to learn. And one of the things this Bible tells us is that we have to learn. Advancement in this kingdom is based on knowledge. There's no way to live a fulfilling life as a believer without having the knowledge of the word of God. And most believers hardly ever touches this thing. So rain, rivers, and wind, those are the things that will always threaten whether you, you know, your house. But depends if you have the teachings and words of Christ, then you can resist and withstand the rivers, the wind, and the rain. They are the tribulations, the trials, the disappointments, the challenges that every single person here and those who are watching online, we have to go through. And that's where we need to make sure we are grounded grounded in God's word. So there are a few things we want to share with you today, and uh, hopefully they will help you do life and relationship better. First thing, if for, just like as you watch the, the bumper for this uh, teaching, you know, we need each other because as iron sharpens iron, it's not just because they lay next to each other, but it's in the grinding against each other. That's why tell, calling yourself a Christian and said you don't want to do life with people that's a lie. There's no such thing as living the Christ life in a vacuum. Amen. Because how are you going to develop the fruit of the Spirit by yourself? That's a lie. You cannot grow and become Christ-like by yourself. Somebody has to get on your nerve. Whether it's your kids, whether it's your husband, whether it's your wife, whether it's you know, uh, your Johnny Bravo boyfriend, somebody's going to do it. And that's the design God has chosen to, you know, to help you reach perfection. Somebody has to get under your skin. How you react determines how much word you have in your system. How you will withstand those storms. When they lie to you, they disappoint you. When they don't keep their word, what do you do? You don't go pay somebody, you know, to you know, get it. Make him disappear. <laughs> so first thing, you know, whether you're dating, whether you're married, you're a parent, you need to prioritize quality time. And which is something we all wrestle, struggle with. Prioritize quality time. Psalm 90 verse 12, reading from the expen. Uh, EXB uh, translation. He said, teach us, make us know how short our lives really are to count our days so that we may be wise. 
gain a wise heart. So teach us, make us know, help us. So we have to make intentional efforts to know. And we have to be intentional when it comes to family, friends, uh, significant others, as to carving out times to be with them. That's why we call ourselves a family. And if you're dating, it's because you're trying to build a family. Hopefully, it can't just be because you want to have fun or eat french fries together. It's going to kill you anyway. So we have to become intentional with those we want to do life with to spend time with them. Engaging in activities that bond us together. The fact is, we can be together, but if we're not doing anything together, we're just two bodies in the same space. And that's the problem with a lot of us, whether it's in dating, whether it's in family. You know, we live in the same house, but we don't do anything together. We come and sleep in this place, we eat in this place, we shower in this place, and then we go out. That is not a family. A family is a group of people who share life together. It's a group of people who are engaged in activities that fosters connection and bonding. What are we doing as a family to bond together? When was the last time as a family we did something together? We sit around a table, we play card, we play Uno. When was the last time as a family did we do something together? If you're dating, it's not just to go to a movie to have somebody entertain you. Can you sit down with that boyfriend or that girlfriend, play Uno for a couple of hours? If you don't develop those habits in the dating period, they're not going to suddenly show up within the marriage if every time we have to go out do something sometimes it's avoidance because we are afraid of just sitting and have conversation on a card game and talking we'd rather surround ourselves with people and be around people so we can be entertained by people so we never have to communicate because we don't really like each other So we try to always have people around us. Let's go out. Let's do this. So we are distracted. That's a sign. That's a flag. Can we just be together and sit and play cards or go sit in the park, look at birds or feed the birds without having, you know, 10 other people to distract us or watching a movie? So whether it's sharing a meal whether it's playing games or simply enjoying each other's company, turn the TV off. Let's just sit as a family. Let's talk. Where are we in our journey? What, what's going on in your life? Where are you? Do you like your job? Do you have any plan for next year? Where do you see yourself in a couple of years? Let's have the discussion. Let's get to know each other. Because time spent together strengthens the bonds of love and commitment. When you don't spend together, uh, time together, you don't strengthen those bonds. Do you have a family game night? You gotta come. You can't have a family. You didn't have any plan. Do you have a family game night? Do you have a card game? Do you have? Uh, you could do a potluck game night. If you have a large family, you could say tonight so and so is bringing this, so and so bring, and the family get together. And we do things together. Like I share with the first service, when we live in Georgia, once a month. We would go to Nelson's Hearst place because they has a, a bar dominium there and we would meet at the barn. The family is pretty large, you know, brothers and sisters with their kids, grandkids. And we would meet at the barn and have a meal every month so the family could, st because you, your kids have cousins they don't even know. The worst thing is cousin ended up marrying cousin at USF because they didn't know. They feel attracted to each other and, uh, well, you're my cousin. I was reading not too long ago, this <laughs> couple, you know, they, they've crossed the line and then they feel like, we, we, let's do a DNA check. And they did the DNA check, they realized they were <laughs> from the same dad. 
Sometimes you got affinity to people. You don't even know why. You might be connected to them. And they're like, what? Yes, it's not sleeping with the enemy. It's sleeping with the brother. <laughs> that is nasty. Just because we don't know each other. Because, you know, you have <laughs> people... People sell stuff, you know, and they have places people want quick money, and they're selling, you know, and then you don't know. <laughs> okay. You could do a movie marathon. For us, you know, we, as a family, we have a, often, you know, family reunion. Even when my girls, like I mentioned, they live in Kennesaw now, you know, uh, but we would do it FaceTime. You know, when they're here too, we, we use the time to have family meetings. Let's see where we are. What's going on? We feel somebody's little in standoffish. What's going on in their world? We have certain things we do for the Christmas season. We have certain movies we will watch. The Polar Express is our thing. We, we, we're going to watch it every Christmas. Except this Christmas, we are like, we didn't watch it because we finally discovered the videos. We said we would switch this year because we finally find videos when the kids were like babies, toddlers, and we said we would watch that. So that's what we did. I, I, I saw when I was young and beautiful, <laughs> you know, I'm being selfish here. <laughs> yeah, I said, Let, let's watch it. For, forget Polar Express, you know. <laughs> let's just watch when I was young. Okay. And the kids were babies crawling all over the place. But it was fun to relive this thing as a family and we talk about how it was and where, our, where we are now, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you got to build those traditions with your family. Do a family service project together. Let's say it's uh, uh, Thanksgiving. Go serve in a soup kitchen. Do something together. As a family, if your kids are grown, you see there's a family in the church with their doors, you know, their, their windows are messed up. You could say, this is a family project. We're going to come and paint your house. You do things together, especially Christian. We should be able to go and say, you know what, we're going to fix the door for you. And you, your kids, you teach your kids to do things like this. You're going to raise decent human beings who are not going to live for themselves. Because we the one who build selfish kids because we live a selfish life. They never see the parents giving their lives, their time to somebody else. It's always been about us. When do we put a pause on us and serve others? That's something you can do. Listen, no other success can compensate for failure in the home. It doesn't matter how much money, how much, how well you get paid, uh, you know, where you live, how big is your house, you know, uh, at the end of the day, no other success can compensate for failure in the home. You can't go save the world and those at home, you're losing them. So make sure you make time. You create time. You carve out time for those who are close to you. Prioritize quality time. Next thing, communicate openly and honestly. Ephesians 4 verse 15, reading from the Mev version, it says, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up. You should underline that. You grow up by speaking truth. If you refuse to speak the truth, all you do is augmenting, creating more distance between you and that other person. Some people think not speaking the truth is a recipe to keep us together. In the long run, all it's going to do is create distance between you and that person. And if you cannot tell someone you claim you love the truth, that's a red flag. Because if the person you say you love should be the first person that we can tell each other the truth. If we can't do that, there's fear, and the Bible clearly says there's no... Okay. 
If there's love, that fear, you say, say, okay, we may be upset with each other for a minute, but at least we're going to tell each other the truth. So communicate openly and honestly. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things uh, into him who is the head Christ himself. So you need in your relationship, whether with your kids, with your spouse, uh, with your friends, relationship, we need to create an environment where we can have open communication. We have to be able to talk. With the, you know, address the difficult issues. We need to know how everybody's feeling. And we want to make sure everybody can be heard, valued, and feel respected. So you need to encourage honest expression of thoughts and feelings. And actively listen to one another. When I say actively listen to one another, not everybody's on their little rectangular devils we call cell phone. And then we're having a conversation. At some point when you are home with your family, you need to put that thing face down. Or have a station so you put it so you can be home. You can't be home, you're still out there in the ether. No, you want to make sure you're home. I always tell people, yeah, for me, I could easily live without my phone. And that's no joke. Every now and then I forget it. It's okay. And my wife will say, you need to have the phone if we get to, need to get a hold of you. Because I told people, I don't think I'm that important. You know, in fact, my phone all week, if none of my girls or Christian text or Sherry needs something, we, I don't, you know, I don't really, people feel that you have to have this. No, I don't have to have it. I don't want, my recipe for life, simple. I don't want to get attached to things. And I've done my, whether it's coffee, whether, whatever it is, I like a lot of stuff. But if you say, what do you really love? I can't tell you. Beside my family, this ministry, if you ask me, what is it? I can walk away from anything. So I'm not attached to things. I've trained myself for that. I love good coffee. Because I, I grew up with it. You know, my dad, you know, good coffee, you know. But I don't drink it. My wife is addicted to coffee. I introduced her to Haitian coffee, and she's an addict. <laughs> and I don't drink coffee. <laughs> you know? But I, I'll drink it every now and then, but I don't have to have it. Because I don't want anything like I have to have this. That, that scared the heck out of me. I don't want anything to control me beside the Holy Spirit. So that's why, you know, if I like something, I feel like I'm liking it too much, I'm going to move away from it. You know, so mm -mm, I, don't, I, don't, I want to live life. If I don't have this, I'm okay. How the conversation starts can have a significant impact on how it ends. So we said we want to have communicate, you know, we're going to have open and honest conversation, but how a conversation begins can have significant impact on how that conversation ends. That's why... Uh, you know, we encourage people when I'm sitting with a couple or somebody, you know, the first thing we're going to say, if there are issues in your family, issues with your kids, practice what we call a gentle start. You can encourage expression of, you know, expressing honest feelings, honest opinions, but begin gently. Because how you begin can dictate where this thing's going to, to go. If you, come, if you come up somebody, you look angry, you know, they, they, they're going to, you know, that's why it is extremely, even for those of us who are parents, you know, if you have an irate child, some, a child that is angry, or even your spouse, there's an issue, we are we're ready to butt head. The worst thing you want to do is to grab a chair, you sit in front of me, or that person sit in front of you. What am I saying? Or we stand. We stand in the kitchen. Because it's like, what do you want to do? Because the posture is already telling me, you know, we might be throwing hands here pretty soon. Okay? And if you're coming at your son, at your daughter, you're like, your teacher call. You are not doing anything in school. The best thing you can do, and this is for free, if you want to calm things down and de-escalate craziness in a relationship, grab a seat, sit next to the person. 
it makes both, both of you vulnerable. And it's difficult to be angry with somebody and loud and cuss somebody when you're sitting next to them. For those of you who are not saved yet. Because if you're still cussing, you ain't saved. I was going to tell you that. There's no such thing. Yeah, you need to, that's a failure of allowing the Holy Spirit to wash with Clorox your tongue. Okay? So you sit next to that child. Because first, it makes us equal, in a sense. It makes us at the same level. And I'm not intimidating, intimidating you by looking at your expression. I'm just going to share the truth with you. I feel hurt when you said what you said. I wish you would not have acted that way. Where do we go from here? And there's no reason why you have to speed. You want to get to the next. Give yourself time. Give the person time to think. Are you going to say anything? No, that's dumb. <laughs> I mean, we, we were, what is it? Where are we going? You're like, did you hear what I said? So you just lose that edge. You have to learn food of the spirit, long suffering, forbearance, patience. Give the person a chance. Give your child a chance to express themselves. Don't insert for them. You're like, oh, are you saying then? I didn't say that. You said it. And then you're beating me up for it. I never said a word. You ask the question, I'm going to have a chance to answer, and you answer it yourself, and then you're like, really? So you can sit next to them and talk to them. That should help you. So gentle start. It's critical as to the path and the course of that conversation. Another thing you need to do, fight the right time and place. Find the right time and place. We call this halt sometimes. Practice those things. You know, if you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, don't have a serious conversation. If people need to have chicken, peanut butter, and bread, let them eat. I'm hungry. I don't want to talk. If I'm trying to sleep, that's when you have a conversation. No, you're not. No, we have to talk about this right now. You're pulling the cover over me. Listen, lady. I'm trying to sleep. You walk in my room, you're like, Johnny, your teacher said you did not turn that project. Mom, I'm tired. That's the wrong time to have that conversation with the kid. And you're not going to reach any good conclu conclusion. So halt. Think of it. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Don't have that conversation. Avoid having conversation when people are experiencing any of these things. The other thing you want to do, use I statements to express feelings. Use I statements to express feelings or needs to avoid accusatory language. You never listen to me. Everybody else take their wife on a cruise. You never take me anywhere. Everybody goes to the beach at least once a year. This family has never been at the beach. I can't even swim. It's your fault. Really? I'm not your daddy. It's not my fault they didn't send you to the YMCA. You know, I'm from Haiti. We don't like the ocean unless we're trying to make it to Florida. It doesn't matter how you make it here. It's all good. So certain times, certain moments, people, you don't want to have those conversations. And when you're having those serious conversations, use I statements. So you don't, people don't feel you're accusing them of things. You never do this. You never do that. Everybody else is doing great things but you. Say instead, I feel hurt when I'm not hurt. I'm not accusing you. I feel neglected when all I do is stay in this house. That's asking you to take me out on a date. 
I don't feel you're accusing me of never take you out. You never take me anywhere. Listen well. That's the next thing. Pay attention to what is being said, both verbally and non-verbally. Sometimes more is being said non-verbally than verbally. Sometimes it's what people are not saying that you have to be careful for. Not actually what they're saying. So pay attention, both verbally and non-verbally expression. It's okay to disagree with people. Even with your own kids, you don't have to agree with them. But you have to give them a chance to express what they're thinking. How do you redirect them th- their thinking and, you know, shape it if you never give them a chance to express what they're thinking? How do you know they're thinking of things wrongly when you don't allow them to speak? No, when I speak, you don't speak. When, li- li- no, listen, you just do what I say. Really? Maybe I'll find a better way to do this, Dad, if you would listen to me. So we need to be respectful in our communication, even when we disagree with somebody. The next thing, focus on problem solving rather than accusing people. Let's see how we can get better. We can get past this. How do we fix this? How can we improve this? What is the purpose of having an, uh, you know, a conversation with somebody if we're going to end up where we started the conversation? That's a waste of time. So if you're about to have a conversation with a child, with a spouse, with a significant other, you have to focus on problem solving. If you don't want problem solving, then walk out of that wish and say, listen, we don't want to work on this. It's okay. You go your way, I go my way. But if you, want, if, if you want to add value to my life and I'm adding value to your life and we're having an issue, let's find some solutions. Work together on finding solution. Listen, the Bible clearly helps us with that. Truth spoken without grace leads always to condemnation. So even when you're speaking the truth, if you don't add grace with it, you, are, you tend to bring condemnation. So even when you want to tell somebody the truth, even when it's time to speak the truth, the Bible says, speak the truth in love. Not because I finally got you, now I'm going to crucify you. Even when you're speaking the truth, speak the truth in love. Because truth spoken without grace leads to condemnation. Yes, they never take you out. That's the truth. But do you have to condemn them? You can say, I feel hurt that, you know, I haven't been out for the past two months. And let them simmer in this. Why did not say, you, you haven't taken me anywhere for the past couple of weeks. You don't do anything with me anymore. Like telling me this is going to make me do things with you. There might be, there might be reasons. The next thing, express love and appreciation. John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And this verse, sometimes we read it, we keep everything gospel. Okay? And uh, what I want you to understand, when Christ said, This is my commandment, that you love one another, that you love your neighbor, you love your friend, you love your kids, you love your spouse, as I have loved you. Meaning, First, I have to see myself rightly. How, I got, how has God loved me? With all my craziness, with all my wrongness, with all my sins, with all the disappointments I have you know, brought to him, he still loved me. So when God said to love you as, I have, as he has loved me, he's telling me to love the whole package. Not just when you do right things, but to love you no matter what. And that's where we put a pause as Christians. We're like, well, I love you when you do good. We love the kids. We celebrate the kids when they bring a good report card. 
You still can have a conversation with the kids who's failing in bringing these all year round. But you cannot tell them, until you do this, nothing for you. No hugs. I'm not going to take you anywhere. Because it's just telling them that love is conditional. If I perform well, I get rewarded. If I don't, there's no love for me. How do you think most kids will actually just give up? Forget you then. Because if you love me, it wouldn't matter. So we want to make sure what message we are conveying in the way we show love. Christ loved us no matter what. If you're perfect, raise your hand. He still loves you. So take the time to express love and appreciation to your family members. And you can easily use the five love language uh, that... uh, uh, Gary Chapman has put together. We begins with the words of affirmation because especially for almost every single human being, especially for males, words of affirmations are critical, critically important for us. You know, when you compliment us on something we've done, you know, it makes us feel we can walk on air like we are supermen. When you tell us that you love us, you appreciate us for our hard work, uh, you know, it, it, makes us feel, it makes us feel good about ourselves. And I share with the first service, one of the reasons Samson, you know, found himself in Delilah's lap, it wasn't because she was that good looking. It's because she, she, uh, she dumped compliment on the guy so much. And even our God, our creator, he moves with compliments, praise his compliments to God. When you, when you tell God how great he is, how wonderful he is. How powerful he is. He said he cannot resist praise. He said he inhabits the praises of his people. Praise is basically complimenting God. Even God cannot resist compliments. So why do we withhold compliment from one another? So words of affirmations are critical for you to build a good relationship. Telling people, you inspire me, you encourage me, I'm proud of you. It meant so much to me when you do, when you say, when you, whatever you do. Why, we would, why do we withhold those things from sharing it with those we claim that we love? The next thing, quality time. Words of affirmation is one, quality time. Meaning spending time together, not sitting next to each other watching a movie, but quality time. Spending time together, doing things together, enjoying each other's company. You have to make the time count with your kids. You have your kids for a short moment of time at home with you. You want to make sure you make it count, especially when they begin in the teens year. If you don't build that relationship with them, they turn 14, 15, they're going to hate you. And you'll think, my kids turn into a little devil. No, it's just reacting because you never show them. When was the last time you hugged them? When they were babies, you hugged them too much. And now you're like, I feed you, I give you money, stay in your lane. So quality time, spend time with them. Make time for your family. The other things, receiving gifts. Words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts. Gifts are basically visual symbols of my love for you. So we said there's no such thing somebody who's in love with you, who loves you, who cares about you, who's going to be stingy with you. That doesn't exist. If they're stingy, they don't love you. I don't care what they say. Oh, that's just the way I am. I'm just stingy. This is my food. Don't touch my food. I mean, I hear people saying, don't touch my food. Don't touch my food. When you love people, you'd rather remain hungry to, to see them eat and enjoy. Because it's about giving yourself. So if you see people even to this level, they want to be first. They want to do, that's a red flag. There's no sacrificial, no commitment in there. Receiving gives visual symbols of what love's supposed to be. Acts of service. Some people, that's how they express their love. They do something for you. They'll come and do your laundry for you. They'll come and say, hey, you want to fix, you want your car to, I can fix that for you. Let let me come to your place. I'll fix the car for you. They want to do things so because they want to express their love for you. If you're married to your wife, don't, I mean, it's cold. It's a cold day in Florida. Okay. 
Fill up her car. Don't make her stand in the gas station. You know, she's... You know, that's your job. You the men, go fill up the car for her. Before, it's just be thoughtful. Put your beanie and go stand there. <laughs> but acts of service, you, you take the pain for somebody else. I told the first service, if you're married, you're in a relationship with a person, you cook, you should not be the one doing the dishes. There's no such thing, I'm the man. There's no such thing in a relationship. There's no man or female. That's what the Bible says. It says, oh, men don't do it. Listen, you can scrub that pan. Wax on. <laughs> if she took time to cook the meal, you can take time to clean. And that will not take anything from your maleness. And you're teaching your kids how to serve. That's what it is. And what most people, some people like, some people don't like, it's physical touch. Expressing and receiving affection through touch, physical closeness, or other forms of physical connection. It's not the same for everybody. Some people love to be touched. You know, a hand on the back, you know, pat on the back and all that. Some people, they eh, don't touch me. You know, but they don't mind you sitting in the same room with them. They don't mind sitting next to you. But you have to hold my hand. Don't hold my hand. Don't do that. Okay, but, but some people love holding hands all day. They want to walk in the sweaty weather of Florida. They want to hold hands in the park. That's the, listen, you know, bring your old hand, keep bring your box of this thing, keep wiping your hand, hold hands. I don't know. If that's what they do, you know, please them, okay? But everybody wants to feel connected with somebody. Your kids want to be hugged. Your wife wants to be hugged. Not under the sheets, but sometime during the day. Okay? Because some people only want to hug during the moment. We have to practice love without any other idea. Can we just sit next to each other? Can we just sometimes, you know, like lips without doing anything else? And we have to not buy into the mindset, oh, I'm a male. What is a man? A man is a dumb person who can think. We can be, I mean, the fact that we reduce maleness to, oh, I can't help myself, it's saying something about you not being responsible. You, you, uh, no, I can't help myself. No, that's dumb. You're a logical, a thinking person. So I'd rather not kiss or hold you because I know if I do that, then I want more me to me. Get out of here. Get a life. But we need to express that. So whether it's through words of affirmation, acts of service, physical affection, let your loved ones know that you care about them. When you love what you have, you have everything you need. And that's the problem people with people in relationship. They, they are with you, but they don't really love you. So they always like, there's a level of dissatisfaction. Always. They always see somebody who's a little better. Some, somebody they wish you were like. If you could only do your hair like this person, you'd be, oh, you'd be just like, oh, you, really? And you stupid enough to accept people treating you like this. Listen. When you love what you have, you have everything you need. You don't have to be comparing me with anybody else. I'm too short. Well, listen, I, I, wasn't, I didn't make me. God made me. What do you want me to do? Stretch myself? <laughs> I can't. So you better love this shorty as he is. Do you understand that? When you love what you have, you have everything you need. And the other thing is resolve conflicts, peace, Fully. Proverbs 15, verse 18. 
reading from the Good News Translation, said, Hot tempers cause arguments, but patience brings peace. When we do things in anger, let me show you what happened, as I did for the first service. This is what happens when we do things in anger. I'm going to be the carpenter this morning, so I can illustrate for you what not to do. That is, if I can open this thing here. Okay, here we go. When, when you're angry, you addressing an issue, you're yelling at somebody, you know, this is actually what you do. You're nailing things into them. Okay, everybody can see this. Because I'm angry, I'm going to say things. I'm going to express myself. I'm going to show you, you, listen, you cannot just walk all over me. Who do you think you are? Well, where would you be without me? You remember when I first met you? You never had ice cream. <laughs> okay, whatever. I'm just trying to be mad of that. I don't know how to be mad. Okay. Okay. So whatever you say when you're angry, okay? So that's, we express, we want to make sure we drill it into you. We want you to understand this because you've hurt me. I want to make sure I hurt you back. Whew. So now I'm calm. I'm no longer angry. And I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for what I said. Would you please forgive me? All right, so we're going to try to pull this nail back. Okay. All right. I pulled the nails, the anger back. But what do you see here? The holes are still there. So this is what you actually do every time. You, have a, you are in a relationship and you get angry and you express yourself in anger. You hurt people, you create holes. Even when you ask for forgiveness, you remove the nails. Those holes are there. So some of us have relationships that are very holy. <laughs> because every now and then, we have a temper issue. And we have to let people know that they can't treat us this way, they can't do that. And some of us, we yell at our kids, we say stuff to them, you remind me of your dad, you're just like your mom, you're loud, you know, you're ugly, you will never mount to anything. We're drilling hole into their lives. So even when we calm down, we go and ask them for forgiveness, the damage has been done. And the deeper we put the, hole, the, the nails the deeper the holes can get. Do you understand that? And some of us, it's like we do it frequently. Because every week we're going to have a, a moment where we're going to act stupid. Yelling, cussing, do whatever, you know, we do. We're hammering holes into those we claim we love. And those damages... Once they are done, they mark us for life. And that's why you see, especially those of us who are teachers, those of us into social work, we know it. We see a lot of issues we see in kids, in other people, it's because of where, what they've been through, what people have done to them. They've drilled holes into them, and they always they still feel that void in them. So they seek to fill it with different things. Sometimes it's uh, illicit sex, sometimes it's dope, you know, and uh, they believe anybody, you know, uh, the gullibles because they have deep holes in their lives because of what somebody they trusted did to them. So you, whether you're in a relationship, you're a parent, you, 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 you have a significant other, do you, do you want to keep doing this to your kids or to your spouse? Let, let me ask you this and be honest. Is that how you want to 
treat them? Because when you, if I were to nail, to nail a bunch of nails all over this and then I remove them, I will weaken. In, you know, at the end, I would weaken this two by four. So you see, the more holes you put in people, you weaken them for temptation to other things. Do you understand this? So, you know, at first, this is a strong piece of wood. But if I nail, I nail a bunch of nails and I remove them, pretty soon I could bend it and break it myself. Because it becomes weakened. And that's what you do when you continue to yell, scream at your kids. You make them so vulnerable that the very things you don't want them to do, they'll end up doing. Whether it's for your spouse too. Even God couldn't, you know, I mean, if we would say God fell, yeah, you know, he, he, his own two children, <laughs> they wouldn't listen. The exact thing he told them not to do, they did. You can have everything in the garden, but not touch this tree. Guess what they did? So sometimes we focus on the negative, don't, 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 and we push, and that's usually why we yell, we scream, don't you know you so and so? You my kid. Don't you know you're a meso nerve? You're not supposed to act that way. You're not supposed to. Uh... Well, what if the kids could go and see you when you were their age? Would you still stand there and say, "Don't you know I'm the pastor? You the child of a pastor." Okay, what if they go back to when I was in high school? They would say, "Ah." You, sometimes we sit in a seat of judgment, like we're above. We're super cool. We're super perfect. And then we treat our kids, we treat people like you failure, you can't live up to my expectations because I'm, God and I, we have breakfast every morning. And we're drilling holes into their lives. Holes that maybe we can never fill up again. So I want you to think about that as you're going to get upset with somebody this week, how you're going to address them. Are you going to drill a hole into their lives? Listen, folks, there are times we must choose to do things not for income, but for outcome. Not for what we can gain, but for what we want. In terms of, do we want this family to stay together? Do we want this relationship to go on? What do we want? Sometimes, is everything necessary to, say, to be said? At the time, we feel like it must be said. If it's going to cause more damage to the relationship with your child, you might want to revisit that at a later time. Especially when you haven't made... Some conversation you may have, you want to have with some people, you may have to go and plan it for six months to make deposit in that person's life so you can have stuff to withdraw. You're not connected with somebody. You cannot tell them anything. And that's one of the reasons children don't listen to a lot of their parents. You have no investment in my life, but you want to tell me how to live my life. So maybe it's time for us to go and begin to make deposit in people's life so we have enough leverage when it's time to have that conversation, at least they know we're coming from a place of love. You haven't made any deposit in my life. All you do is keep withdrawing or nailing nails in my life. Of course I'm angry with you. That's what we call in the gospel, yielding to win. We don't go and say, I'm the husband. You listen to what I say. I pay the bills. I'm the, the Bible says, don't use the Bible, please. Say, I'm the head. Tell them to continue to read the other half of the scripture. He said, the head of the family dies for the family. Next time they say, they say are you willing to die? They tell you that the head said, okay, you're the head. You're willing to die? Show me how you're dying to yourself to serve us as a family. Yielding to win. How you get a thing reveals why you want the thing. If you force it on somebody so they could listen, it shows what you're trying to do. Are you trying to stay in control or get in control of me? Or are you trying to really help me? So if you come to me and say, it's because I'm the husband, while I say, that's what I want, that's how it's going to be. Remember, how you get a thing reveals why you want the thing. Because if you honor me, it shows the motive behind what you want. 
So remember, when you're talking, you're addressing something with, some, with somebody, whether it's your child, your spouse. How you get it also reveals why you want it. So we need to be mindful of the language we use when we're talking to people. Always try to separate the problem from the person. Always try to separate the problem from the person. Always try to separate the problem from the person. Don't, you know, they may be in a bad situation, but they're not, they're not that. They're not what they have done. You are not what you have done. Some of us have done some crazy things. But we are not what we have done because we've been washed by the blood of Christ. So we have to give people grace also. So always separate your child, separate your husband from the actions they've done. You don't call your kids your, kid, your husband, you're a loser because they've made a mistake. Because the game didn't go as you planned, they didn't play well. You're like, you're a loser. Always separate the person, you know, the problem from the person. And not everything is worth arguing and fighting over. Something, listen, the food is like salt. Get off your blessed assurance. Get some salt, put it on. Don't say, what is this? I might as well go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, go there. Get the grease and die. <laughs> I'll drive you right there. <laughs> you need to live. <laughs> Not everything needs to be said. And that's the, that's the thing growing up in wisdom will tell you. Sometime, what helps you, what, will, what has helped me, you know, uh, whether it's with Sherry or with my kids, and I know people who have touched my lives, the way they've done it is they've learned how to climb into the hole with me. Because it's easier for me to accept your reprimand or whatever you're going to say, if you climb into the hole with me and you sit with me, then I can stand with you. If you never sit with me, it's difficult for me to tell me, oh, yeah, I got your back, man. I don't know that. I don't trust you. I don't even know you, man. You haven't proved yourself. When I was in a hole, I didn't see you. So even with your kids, when they find themselves in a pit, go sit with them. That's what Christ did for us. While we were yet sinners, he didn't throw a lifeline and said, grab it and come out. He climbed into the hole and sat next to us and said, you know, I see where you are. I know you're discouraged. I know you feel betrayed, disappointed. You feel like a failure now. Hmm. You don't have to die here, though. There's a way out. I can help you out. Do you want to hold my hand? God will never force himself on anyone. Never. He loves us too much and he respects us. God cannot save you against your will. If you want to walk out of the gospel today, you're free to do so. Imagine Adam and Eve. I mean, imagine. It broke, it broke God's heart, but he had to let them go. God cannot save you against your will. It's just like you cannot make any, you cannot make your child do anything. You know that? You can force it on them, they'll do it in front of you if you don't win their hearts. That's what parents need to understand. You have to win their hearts, fight for their hearts. For anybody. The only reason, you're not, always, you're not 24-7 with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your husband. If they want to do stupid things, they're going to do it. It doesn't matter if you put a 360 or 560 or a million 60. Ah, just listen, people will do what they want to do. But if you have their heart, they know you're with them no matter what. They love you. They're going to respect and honor you. And that's what God expects from you and I. He wants our hearts. Because he knows when the rain, the wind, the temptations come because we've made him first. We're going to prioritize our relationship with them. And your kids will stay away from craziness, from stupidity. You know why? Because 
if you invested to them, they're like, I love my parents too much. I know what it will do to them. I don't want to break my daddy's heart, so I won't do this. Not because they don't want to do it, but because you have invested in them. You have, you've come and climbed with them in some mess at times when you didn't judge them. You, you went into the bedroom. You just got on the bed with them. You didn't say anything. They cry. And you're like, okay, let them cry. You hold them, and then you say, okay, see you. <laughs> you, you go back. You didn't say, how could you be so stupid to do this? You withhold judgment. There's a time for everything. And then guess what? That's why they're not going to do what other kids are doing because they're like, man, I could do it, but I know what it would do to my parents. It would break their hearts. I'm not going to do it. Do you have enough leverage with me that I want to honor you in that way? How much have you invested in me that will cause me to think that way? We chase the money, we chase the big career, and we neglect the kids. Remember that quote we talked about at first? No other success can compensate for the failure in the home. It doesn't matter how successful you become. If you fail at home, there are things most young people have been through. Most people, you're going to go through stuff. You're going to make mistakes. But there are a lot of things you could have avoided. Had you had a decent relationship with somebody who invested time in you, you wouldn't be so gullible and swallow so many lies from dumb folks. Because anybody who's geared at lying and abusing, taking advantage of people, you're not a decent human being. So you as a Christian, even with your wife, with your spouse, with your husband, with your kids, you can be abusive, especially when you're in a position of power. You provide for them. So you have to be careful how you talk to them. Because pretty soon, there's a fine line be between being a disciplinarian, wanting the best thing for them, and becoming abusive. Because you have the power. You do what I say. So my hope for us to do relationship well is to love each other, one another, our spouses, our families, our kids, our friends, the way Christ has loved us. Make sure we give people elbow room to make mistakes. You are not perfect. You cannot expect perfection from other people. And let's stop putting holes in people. You're not a soldier. Don't put lead in people. Stop nailing holes in people. Would you stand on your feet, please? Do you know God loves you? I don't want you to feel guilty and, uh, and you know, that's not the purpose here. But I want you to visualize certain thing and and to live a life that is according to God's plan what he wants for us and have a family that really reflects his glory and his love it takes practice it takes making mistakes it takes going home today and said you know what I've been wrong the way I've been doing this with you I mean, you as a parent, it's okay to sit with your son, with your daughter, and ask for forgiveness. You put too many holes in their lives. Don't wait until it's too long and it's too late for you to make things right. Take him out. Go to Stone Creamy here. Get them some ice cream, sit with them. Have a meal and express your regrets 
and bring that relationship back the way it's supposed to be. You can't expect people to respect you even when they know there's a need for you to ask for an apology, to present an apology and you act like it doesn't exist. That doesn't make you a good parent. If you've hurt your adult child, it's okay to say, you know what? I was wrong. And your kids who are 12, 10 too, if you begin to go to them and say, listen, I should not have voiced my voice like this. I'm, I'm sorry. They begin to see their parents in a different light. And you're building character in them. You'll be amazed at the kind of people they'll become tomorrow. Our church today is to stop putting holes in people. And we frame how we talk to people. And shift the way we've been treating them. And doing it in a loving way. A way that is aligned to Christ's calling into our lives. Would you bow your heads, please? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you love us in spite of our craziness. In spite of our shortcomings, you never distance yourself from us, Father. And help us to love each other the same way, Father. Not on performance, not based upon our accomplishments, Father, but because you loved us and because we are your children. And we are each other's keeper also, Father. Bless us as we depart from this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My heart.